This is the Aptitude Outdoors podcast where we interview travelers, explorers, and outdoorsmen and women to bring you the best tips and stories from around the world. Life is hard, and we're out here doing larger-than-life things. Whether it's pushing ourselves physically in the outdoors or mentally at work or in the podcast studio, Absolute Aid is here to help you focus, recover, and stay calm during your most intense moments. Absolute Aid, created by nature, made with science, for those who seek to do more. All right, everybody, welcome back to the Aptitude Outdoors podcast. Thank you for tuning back in. Today, we have special guest, Appalachian Trail through hiker author of, I don't want to mess this up, I'm going to read it, The Unlikely Through Hiker and host of the Unlikely Stories podcast, the one and only Mr. Derek Lugo. Derek, how are you doing today, man? I'm good, man. You got it right. Thanks. <laughs> for the invite. I'm glad to be here, brother. Yeah, yeah. And so, obviously, I read your book, bringing lots of memories back for me about through hiking. It's a wild ride. And the thing I want to talk about first, which I don't know honestly how you react to this, is the Doyle. What is your thoughts on that place? I don't want to strike you with a, a, a defaming question right off the back, but I'm not scared to share my opinion on that place. <laughs> tell, tell, tell me what you think, and then I'll, sure. I'll, I'll, I'll answer. It was scary, and it was the memory I have of the Doyle is I was taking a shower, which is like hard to come by on the trail. You're really excited to get it clean. And someone was showering above me and the water was dripping on my head. And I said, this is grosser than being on the Appalachian Trail and just being nasty and smelly. <laughs> that was my experience. So I'll let you say whatever you want about that, but uh, okay. I have fond um, memories. <laughs> I, so I was hiking. I, I, I was hiking. Well, the Doyle was like, AT famous for, yes. or, oh, yeah. or infamous, I should say. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so I knew ahead of time that it wasn't, because I've heard stories and I'm not knocking a place. I mean, they catered to what I needed. So I have mm -hmm. nothing but love. Absolutely. But the person I was hiking with um, at the time, Shanti, you, she's in the book, you remember her. Yeah, yeah. Um, she was like, we're not staying there. <laughs> and I said, okay, but <laughs> we did go there. We went to the bar. And we hung out at the bar and I had, you know, I was starving. We mm -hmm. ate, we had, you know, a couple beers. And then we walked down. There was a campsite not far from there. Maybe you pay maybe a couple dollars or whatever. Uh, so that's what I did. So I didn't actually stay there. But I've heard stories of, you know, cockroaches and <laughs> critters and stuff. Now, that being said, <laughs> um, that being said, a shower takes it like i've i've bathed in like streams uh rivers outside in the cold yep. so having a shower indoors i don't care man like we <laughs> sleep outside in you know in the woods with critters like i've gotten bitten by spiders i've woken up with like you know my arm swollen because something bit me you know mm -hmm. like we're through hikers we shouldn't complain although we do but that being said they are they are offering a service. And mm. just because we are through hikers doesn't mean you can just give us whatever we mm. should have, you know, it, sh it should be decent. That being said, I would just be depending. Also, I don't know how much it was, but if they're not charging a lot, I'm, I'm okay. I took a shower, you know, and I'll just, you know, wipe things around me or whatever, <laughs> but yeah, I'm so, uh, no one's ever asked me about that. I love it. We're starting good. <laughs> I, I just had to know, I was thinking like, how am I going to like structure this? I usually start with like, how did you get into the outdoors? And I'm like, well, they can read the book and figure that out. It's not that, right. cool. but, um, anyway, yeah, I just wanted to know because that we both hiked a few years ago. It's been a while now. I was in 2015. Mm -hmm. I believe you were in 2012. Was that right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So yes. yeah, a few years apart and it's just such a wild experience, man. I don't, I, nothing I've ever done in my life, even like now, what, I'm probably like what, six, seven years later just has compared to that. So I really want to like understand because I grew up, in southeast michigan michigan's very outdoorsy state very rural like i i grew up in like the woods so i would like the woods was not weird or scary to me 
And Mm -hmm. it was just where I lived. Like, we lived in, we played outside, we shot BB guns, just like typical Midwest Michigan stuff. You're coming from New York City, which I've been to once or twice. And to me, that's scary. That's Mm -hmm. like, I don't know how to operate in like these Mm -hmm. totally closed in, like, just tight places like like new york that just scares me one of my best friends on the trail is from new york and she like she's kind of has a similar story to you You just you're just like i'm doing this so what was that like for you stepping foot on the appalachian trail not a lot of outdoors experience you know really like fresh with this because i with my experience outdoors as a kid growing up for essentially my whole life i was scared shitless man like i was shaking Mm -hmm. when i got out of the car to like hike so I can't imagine for someone growing up in like the city, like how that would trans, like I, I can't imagine. So what was that like for you? Man, so <laughs> it, I, I love everything you just said. And yeah, it's been actually 10 years for me since I threw hike uh, the Appalachian Trail. And it's a little different for me now because as soon as I got off the trail, I was talking about it. I was doing mm-hmm. talks I was, yeah. and I started writing about it and my book came out. So I was... It took me, I say it took me six months to do, to, to hike the actual AT, but I was reliving it for years after that. So I know how I feel about now wanting to go back out there and do something else, like another through hike or just mm-hmm. to be out in the wood, because I remember that feeling and with everything that's going on, I want that feeling again. You know, so I get that. That wasn't your question, but I just wanted to add that. Mm -hmm. Now, going back to your question, I didn't know during that time it was. And I'm so I'm so happy I was going through that phase because it's so it's different now for me. The reason why I do the outdoors now is way different. Mm -hmm. But at the time, it was more of a challenge. And I'm a. I'm a big storyteller. I love sharing stories. It stemmed from when I was a little kid, like talking my way out of, you know, trouble and stuff like that. (laughs) And realizing that I had a power with my words where people would stop and listen to what I was saying, even if it was nonsense, they would listen. And living in New York City, I worked as a bartender. So I always felt like as a bartender, you want to get paid, you better be a good bartender, not just pouring good drinks, but the company, because people can just buy anything like beer or wine and go home and and drink but they go to bars to socialize to you know you they're paying that extra to be in that environment and that includes the bartender Mm -hmm. so i always felt like i'm going to continue sharing my stories and now that i'm a bartender i want to have more stories to share so i was all about doing and and i'm a big reader also so i didn't just want to read about these adventures i wanted to be a part of it and share stories so I started off by do, like traveling a bit. I traveled around Europe, uh, and then I did the States. I'm a big baseball fan, so I hit every major league baseball park. So that was my way of cool. discovering uh, um, like the major uh, U.S. cities mm-hmm. and um, just exploring where I'm from. So that that was always something I wanted, always wanted to do, and I. Th- at some point I said, I have to expand this a little bit outside of just city life. Cause although I was going to these ballparks and other countries, I was hitting cities, you know, it wasn't me in the wilderness or hiking, whatever. So, and like I mentioned earlier, I'm a big reader and someone handed me a walk in the woods mm-hmm. and I'm, sh- I'm sure you read or heard yeah. of it yeah. at least. And, um, they, they just handed it to me. They didn't say anything about, <laughs> it being about the Appalachian Trail. They just said, it's a funny read. You're going to dig it. Do it. Read it. And I was like, yeah, man, it's hilarious. But the one thing that stuck out was this trail that not many people do or accomplish. And I was like, man, you know what? If I want to continue doing the stuff that I'm doing as far as discovering other places and adventures and stuff, I think this is something I want to do. And it just stuck in the back of my mind, not something I was planning to do, but I had just came back from Italy. I had some time, free time. I didn't have responsibilities. I had sublet my apartment. So everything freed up. One night I said, you know what? Without even, the only thing I knew about the Appalachian Trail was from that book. So that's very little. I said, I'm going to hike the Appalachian Trail. And within a week and a half, two weeks, 
I was on the trail. Wow. Yeah, nuts. <laughs> That's awesome, though, because, like, there's a lot of good points you make in the book and I you kept the book the book very positive and mm -hmm. I think that's good because there's a lot of room to complain about the Appalachian Trail mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. a, a thing I'm really big on is choice like it's something I chose to do something you chose to do so why are we complaining about it like it's hard we knew it would be hard we knew it would be like this once in a lifetime if we're lucky kind of experience and it's it's life changing it really is. I don't think it would not change anybody's life who's done something like that because, and I in the book I know you don't cuss a lot, but I, I do, so I apologize. <laughs> it's if okay. that offends you. But like, I'm a, I'm a grown up. I'm okay. <laughs> I, I've heard I don't, them all. I don't. I don't really give a shit about a lot of stuff anymore that would normally like get a lot of people worked up, and it's so funny to have like the trail just liberates that from you. I feel like because you just don't care anymore. Like okay, I can't go and do this one thing I wanted to do. Well, in, in the woods, you can't do anything. You can sit down, you can read a little, you can sit and think about your life a little bit and contemplate, stare at a squirrel for a while. Like, that's it. <laughs> to me, that's the meaning of life. Like, what else matters? Like, I like mm -hmm. talking to people like you. I like talking about the outdoors. So, you know, have you, how, how has your life changed post Appalachian Trail? I mean, we're talking almost a, de a decade since you've been done. How has that, one experience, which granted it's a long experience, how has that changed your life? Better, worse, whatever. It it it, it changed it so much so that it changed my career path. Mm -hmm. Um, and I've heard stories that the AT would would do that, like hike, through hiking itself, wherever it is, if it's other trails or whatever. But yeah, absolutely, it, through hiking the Appalachian Trail, I've heard it's going to change your life. And I remember I shared I love sharing this story because. Hikers go into this thinking that, and I was asked the question, or it was a group of us, and one hiker was like, hey, um, and I think I mentioned this in the book, but she, she was like, hey, you know, I've heard, you know, everyone's saying that this will change your, your life. I, I'm not feeling it. Have you guys ever, have you guys felt it or whatever? And people would, you know, throw in their points and mm -hmm. say this and that, but I really didn't, all I had to say to her was, look, it doesn't just come to you. Like the clouds aren't going to part and there isn't going to be like a voice say, this is your life. Now it's, that's yeah. not how it works. And you, what you're, like you said earlier, you take it all in. Okay. It's the, it's the experience. The same stuff you're going to be doing in the out in the quote unquote real world. Mm -hmm. You know, like I always say that when I was on the Appalachian trail, I was able to complete my thoughts because I couldn't do that yes. in here. There's so many distractions. And when I got off, First of all, that there was a lot of reasons why I was unlikely on the trail. And we can touch on that. I'm open to talk about whatever you want. Like, I'm down with that. Um, but I, from the beginning, I stuck out. I don't look like a hiker, um, not just because of my color, but the way I looked also. Like, I had bandanas hanging from my, like, I didn't, I had all the right gear I was supposed to wear, but I wore it my way. You know, mm -hmm. like I did, yeah. I did it my way, not trying to be different, but it felt comfortable. And I was like, you know what? Um, I was this way in New York. I'm going to bring a little bit of who I am into the trail. And then if it changes, it changes, you know, that's what I'm here for that change. But I was who I was. And now I'm even different than I was before I started the Appalachian Trail. You know, like I'm a totally, when I do another through hike, it's, and we can talk about that later, but I'm yeah. definitely I, I'm going to go, I'm going to approach it totally different, differently than I did the AT because I'm a different person mm -hmm. and I've learned so much, but yes, as far as changing my life, it changed it completely. I went from bartending at night, uh, running live venue, uh, live music venue, uh, places at night, yeah. the nightlife of New York city to now I just do talks. I educate. Um, now with you know, Zoom has blown up, <laughs> you know, I do a lot of virtual talks. I have a lot, um, a lot of talks in library schools coming up and uh, my podcast, uh, my writing. I have, have a lot of writing projects. So it went from, you know, obviously, well, not obviously, but I've, I've been writing my entire life. And after the AT, that's when my writing career just skyrocketed. 
mm-hmm. you know, because I didn't have anything that I wanted to, sh- I, I've had a bunch of manuscripts before I, I threw hype, but nothing that I wanted to share. And when I, to, with the public anyways, um, <laughs> and when I finished the AT and, and, and was writing the book, I said, this is something that, cause I had such, I had, I, I loved what just happened to me. I just loved yeah. it. And I wanted to share it with people. And I said, people need to hear this. I don't care if they don't want to hear it. I want it because I'm going to continue talking about it for the rest of my life. And this was the first piece of work that I wrote that I knew I was going to get published. I didn't know how it was going to happen, but I knew it was going to happen. It was going to get published. And it did. Like, it, and, and from that moment on, it just changed everything for me. That, that is the attitude that I wish so many people could find in their life because I'm such a huge proponent of anybody can do anything. Like I, there is nothing special about my life from before I did the AT, doing the AT, after I've done the AT that would lead me to doing any of the things that I've accomplished, which like the AT is a huge thing. And people like you and me, when we're done, we take it for granted. We're just like, oh, yeah, I, it's just another thing because we talk about it so much. But to right. the average person who has not through hiked or done anything like long distance, whatever, written a book, a huge, huge hill to climb like that is. I get so excited about it because when I think about it, I'm like. You can do this. You, my neighbor, you, my guy up the road, you, the guy listening to my podcast, you could do this. Like, absolutely could do this because all it took for me was <laughs> wanting to do it and saying, I'm going to do this. Like, I literally said to myself multiple times, and I, I kind of, we kind of have opposite stories. My story is a little different than yours. I started pretty late and I ended up really late, like end of October in Maine. So it was like, you started in the cold and ended in when it was a little bit cold. Like I started when it was hot and I ended when it was Uh really cold. And like, it's just these, like anybody can overcome that. Like I told myself multiple times, like I will die to get this done. Like I don't care what I have to do. And that's, that's what it takes sometimes, man. And like, yeah, I, I I wrote this down because this, this quote really struck me. You said something like, uh, where is it? Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, no, it's okay. Uh, oh, I'm not going to fall into a mindset of maybe I'll make it. Positive thoughts are my biggest asset or here in the unknown, out here in the unknown. But that's so profound, man, because like just saying you're going to do it is sometimes mm-hmm. more than enough. You don't have to yeah. be the strongest, fastest, lightest, toughest. So where did you come to this conclusion? Is this just how you live your life overall? Or is that just like uh, something you came to while hiking? It, it, it's, it's a combination of things. But the main the main thought behind that was I had so much going against me because I didn't have the experience mm-hmm. at all. Like I'd never hiked before. I, I didn't even know if I liked hiking, dude. Yeah. I walked into this saying, I'm going to get from Georgia to Maine. That's it. That's my goal. I don't that's care it. if I hate it. I don't care <laughs> if I'm, I'm going to, I'm going, that's my, that's my goal. And I, I, I approached it where I didn't necessarily embrace everything, but I accepted everything. Meaning I that's knew I was the going, key. Right. I Accepting knew I was it. going to get in. I knew I was going to hike in rain, the cold. I don't even like the cold. My peeps are from the tropics. I hate the cold, dude. <laughs> and I knew I was going to do that, and I did. I didn't know I was going to hike in a snowstorm, and I did. Mm-hmm. Um, I knew it was going to be mountains. Climbs were my uh, my Achilles heels. Like I, yes. it was the worst thing for me. Even when, like, before I threw hike, when I was running in Central Park, every time I went up a hill, I was like, <gasps> "I'm dying here," you know, like I couldn't breathe. <laughs> and I knew that was going to be a thing. And Dude, I'm from Ohio. I get it. Like, I, I yeah, I get it. <laughs> yeah. So, so you you get it. And um, I knew all these things were like go- going to happen to me, mm. but I said, you know what? I have one thing that's really powerful and that's my mind. And how do I keep that mind powerful is if I keep it positive. If I go, Hey, I'm not going to, when people, I think you're quoting a section where someone said, when I said, I'm going to hike the app, the entire Appalachian trail, we're at Springer mountain. I remember this like it was yesterday. It was 10 years ago. Um, and the, and the guy was, the guy was like, well, you're gonna, you're gonna attempt it. And I said, uh, uh, 
I ain't, I'm not going to go. I'm not going to go there. I'm not going to think that way. I'm actually going to finish the entire Appalachian Trail because mm-hmm. again, so much going against me that day. I learned how to use everything, all my gear, like the gear I had in my backpack. I didn't even know how to, you know, yeah. filter water. I didn't know how to boil water. I didn't know how to do any of that stuff. And I still was like, this is what I'm going to do. And you have to hold on. If you want to throw right, and this is with any goal you have in life. If you, if you want to accomplish it, you got to hold on to something and stick with it. You got to, there has to be something that's, that gets you going and say, Hey, look, this is the reason why I'm doing it. Mm-hmm. And you have to stay on it. You can't go, Oh, maybe I will and expect to finish it. I'm going to tell you a quick story. It's in the book. Actually, you know about this one. So when I got to Springer Mountain, there's this one guy, the dude was, he knew everything about the Appalachian Trail. I thought he was the spokesman of the AT. I was like, if anyone's <laughs> going to make it, it's going to be this dude. He knows everything. Yeah. And I saw, I won't mention his name. Maybe I do in the book, but I, I'm not going to mention it now. But I saw him a few days later because the first few days we were on the trail, it was raining. It was like, and I was like, you know what? This this is it. I'm, I'm hiking in the rain. And I we got into camp and he was with a group of people and the one guy that was with him was trying to keep it positive. He said, you know what? We hike, embrace the rain, embrace the rain, you know? And, and, uh, and then another person came in from that group was like, we're on the AT. And I was like, that's right. And then that same guy from Springer Mountain, who I thought was a spokesman came in and he looked so miserable. His hair was all wet. It was smacked against his face. And I said, yo, what's up, man? <laughs> hey, Because I was excited to see him. I haven't seen him in a few days. And I was like, oh, man, this dude is, is awesome. And he looked at me. He just grunted. And I knew <laughs> that guy was defeated. I knew he was defeated. I knew before he even got knocked down. I was like, that guy is not going to make it. As much as I wanted him to make it, I was like, there's no way. And within uh, two weeks, he was off the trail. So it, like you said, it doesn't matter if you're the strongest. It doesn't matter if you have all the experience in the world. It's what's between your ears, man. It's really what's yeah. between your ears. Because I've seen hikers that can hike way fast. I'm not the fastest hiker, you know, and, 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 so, and I'm not the strongest. But I've seen guys that were dominant on a trail. And I was like, yo, man, if I had that dude's body, man, I'd be doing, I'd be a triple crowner in, in three months. <laughs> you know? And they just like, if they're, they're and, and they're not into it, they're just like, you know what? I'm just going to get off the trail. You know, you, you have to decide going into this. If you're going to do it, say, hey, I'm going to do it. I'm going to finish it. Not go into it and say, hey, we'll see how it goes. Then obviously... You'll see how it goes. And that's your height. Hike your own yeah. height. I'm not saying it's wrong. I'm I'm just saying for people that want to accomplish this goal, you got to go in there with a mindset. You got to go in there with like, hey, this I'm going to go through a lot. My body's going to go through a lot. But your mind is going to be strong if you let it. And yeah, I've I, post AT and, and somewhat pre AT, I, I read a lot of books about, well, well, in training for it, I read a lot of books the the books everybody knows what books are out there for the at like i read all of them and um i don't have a cool... mine, i hope mine ends up being one of the top ones too it so. has to be it <laughs> yeah. exists there's not that many so it's got to be up there already so well, and, there, there, there's a lot of there's a lot of at books out there but they're not necessarily you know well written yeah you know you, everyone i always say everyone has a great story to share it depends on how you share it you know absolutely so. which mm-hmm. brings me to a point uh, I noticed that you narrated your own audiobook because I'm a huge audiobook listener. I, I do read, actually, believe it or not, with my with my eyes occasionally. But um, <laughs> with doing all these podcasts and talking to lots of authors and stuff, and I I just like plow through. I'm like, I'll do the dishes and just like listen and take it all in and take yeah. notes and stuff. But what was that experience like? Because I I do this like w- twice a month. I talk and I do it for work a little bit. Um, we do a podcast at work. And I mean, I talk for an hour and I get off here. I'm like, oh, my God, I don't I don't know if I can do this anymore. How was that like recording an audiobook? You're talking probably like, what is it? It's like a five, six hour audiobook, And you're probably talking 10 times that amount. <laughs> What's yeah. That experience uh, like? th- Selfish th- question th- for me. Th- thanks for asking that, because when it first happened and I and I would do podcasts, I would wait for people to ask for that. And you, I think you may be one of the first people to ask. And 
when I was doing it, I was like, this is harder than hiking the Appalachian Trail, <laughs> man. This is super hard. Yeah. But I do talks and um, I'm not shy, you know, like I don't get any kind of stage fright or anything like that. Uh, but this is different. Like I had, a, I did it with Audible. So I had a uh, director, producer, um, audio engineer, and I, there was a team there. So as I'm reading this, I had it on my iPad. There's a director that's in my ear. So if I mispronounce something or she feels like, hey, cause she, she read the book ahead of time and we would talk a little bit how we want this chapter to go. And she was great. She was like, dude, I felt this way. Tell me what you thought about this. And like, she was just right there with me. And then you had the audio engineer that would, um, would be like the backup. Like if I mispronounced something and she was like, and she was from um, England. So she was like, I don't know if you Americans uh, pronounce it like that. And I was like, <laughs> well, I don't know. Uh, Mike, what do you think, Mike? And Mike was like, no, I think he got it. <laughs> so, um, but then there were other times when I wasn't pronouncing something. Mike was like, no, nah, no, nah, Derek, you, it's this way. So, but doing that in the beginning, I was nervous and I was, I was surprised I was nervous. So like, man, I've been, you know, I've been doing this for years, man. I've been talking for years. You know, mm-hmm. I know what I'm doing. You know, it was hard because in the back of my mind, I was like, people are going to listen to my voice because I knew I wrote something. I wrote, this isn't the best piece of work I'm ever going to write, but at the time it was the best piece of work. Mm -hmm. And I felt like I wanted to do the same with the audio book. And I'm so grateful for the audio engineer because those guys pieced it together where it made it sound like seamless and I remember doing the first three four chapters and by the end we did it in like four days if I'm mistaken four or five holy days holy crap yeah, yeah and 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 at the end she goes yeah like you got the hang of it she's like we're gonna go back to the first few chapters and redo them and I was like obviously because she said it it takes not every author can actually do their own audiobook. They can't. It's just like some authors can't do public speaking. They just mm-hmm. write. You know? And she said, for the most part, the first few chapters are practice chapters. So those are chapters where you get used to what's going on, um, how to do it. And I got a bunch of tips where, you know, you put the paper right underneath one line and you just go, you know, all the way down. And I was like, oh, that's a great way to do it. And then she was like, get an apple because my mouth would get dry. She's like, bite into an apple, you know, chew on it. That helps have water right next to you, tea, all that stuff. And uh, I did it. And when I was done, oh, and there's one, there's one chapter in there that when I read it, um, I couldn't, I I can't stop like tearing up. It's like one of the worst chapters. I don't know if you know. Let's see. Let's see how good you're, if you remember it. What chapter do you think that would be the hardest for me to revisit? The one with the dog. Exactly. I knew it. it. Exactly. That is a sad story. Every time I read, the chapter is called Magic, and every time I revised it or had to do edits or whatever, I would choke up, dude. My eyes would water. My eyes would well up, and I just, it was hard. So when we got to that chapter, when I was reading it, I was halfway through the chapter and I had to stop. And I said, guys, hold on, I got it. And the director was like, I'm surprised it took you that long. I thought you were going to stop <laughs> earlier than that. And I couldn't. And then I just started bawling, dude. I was, I'm getting the chills right now. I just started bawling. And they gave me all the time in the world. I like composed myself and went back to it. And to this day, when we, when I, if I do talks at schools or whatever, it's hard for me to talk about it. And I tell people this, I'm like, look, you might catch me at like a vulnerable, like I'm going to, I might start crying right here, you know, <laughs> and, uh, but they, but in that chapter, and I think the last chapter is, is worth, are the two that really, they really get me. Mm-hmm. Uh, but the magic chapter is like, you, you mentioned magic and I'm balling <laughs> like a baby. <laughs> Dude, that's, that's hard, man. And, and that's, that's something that, 
I would have never been aware of because I, I, I like listen to a lot of audiobooks because, you know, I have with my job, there's a lot of time videos are exporting, audios exporting. That's a huge time sink. And it's just like, what do you do during that time? So I try and be productive as possible, like in the day that I have. Um, cause I'm like, I'm a big, you know, like you could die tomorrow kind of guy. So I just try and mm-hmm. get as much in as I can every day. And, and I listen to audiobooks and I think it was, uh, I'm not sure if you're aware, uh, like Steven Rinella, big outdoor writer, like hunting and stuff. I know you're a vegetarian, but he's like, he's a big in the outdoors world. Mm-hmm. And, and, uh, he, he talked about one time on his podcast, he was saying like, I sent my audiobook off someone else to read it for me because I'm just busy. And he's like, I heard it. And immediately it was like, called the, the publisher. He's like, I got it. I gotta do this myself. I can't do it. Like, can, can, can I mention something real quick? Yeah, yeah, so yeah. I, have, I have a close, I love that you brought that up. I have a close friend that has narrated over 500, probably 600 now, uh, books. Wow. He does, uh, those romance books and they're okay. really popular. Either. Not my so genre, does, but yeah. <laughs> not, not mine either. Not mine either. I'm sure about that, dude. I, I see one in the background. Then. No, I'm oh, kidding. Well, that's the X-Files. By, by the way, I love your backdrop. Your backdrop oh, you. is like so dynamite. I really dig that, that look. You. I'm all about that. I'm on the road, so like my backdrop is just a blue wall. But for the, I love when your setup is really dope, man. I dig it. Appreciate it. Um, but so my buddy, Mike, his name is Mike, um, he was like, look, my book came out. It was the uh, it was the uh, the book release weekend, at, and I had a party, and it fell on. It came out the day before my birthday, so on my birthday, I had, like, a book release party. He came, got a copy. Two days later for my birthday, he was like, look, man, I just wanted you to hear what it would sound like if I did your, the, you know, the audio for, for your book. And I was like, oh, that's dynamite, man. You didn't have to do that. He did three chapters. I listened to it. I was like, hell no, 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 hell no. I was like, there's no way. There's no way because he didn't know where the high points were. He didn't know Mm -hmm. certain things. He just read it, which is okay if you want to just hear it. But I was like, I I know the ups and downs. I know when to stop. I know the emotions. Like, I couldn't imagine him. The emotions I had through that chapter of magic, I can't imagine him feeling that and having that. So it, I, and as much as I love that he did that, he didn't have to do that. He did three chapters and that's a lot, you know, and he's yeah. got like a lot of work lined up and I totally appreciate that. But I think what came out of that was I had to do it. Yes. You know, that was it where he was like, he showed me like, this is how it would probably be if I did it or someone else did it because I necessarily, not, I necessarily didn't want to do it. Mm-hmm. Or wasn't thinking of doing it, I should say. But my readers and my audience, they were like, dude, we want to hear your voice. We want you to say. And I was like, oh, I don't know. And then when he sent that to me, I was like, oh, yeah, I'm going to do it. Yeah. <laughs> okay, how hard it is, I'm going to make it do what it do. <laughs> and, and back to that mindset, man. I love that mindset when people are like, it's the whole, if you want something done right, you got to do it yourself kind of thing. Like, if that's, that's why... I, I, it's so important to just like tackle things head on. Like they're scary. They're hard. Lots. That's life. Like, I don't know what I'm doing 99% of the time, but I just go for it, man. I don't really care. Like, and that's, that's something I learned on the AT. Like none of us know what we're doing. We're all just out here, like hoping for the best most of the time. But, uh, to kind of, you know, change maybe topics a little bit here. I, I created this podcast probably, much like when you started writing your first book, you're like, I'm just going to write this and I'm going to do it because I really love doing this. Like, that's why we all do it. That's why we all do anything. And, you know, I think a lot of people focus on money or they have some sort of agenda they're trying to push where it's like, I love the outdoors and I want every single person to love the outdoors. That's all I care about. I don't watch sports I don't like, I don't do anything. Like all of my fun activities for me are outdoors. I went ice fishing for the first time last weekend. Like I just, I love doing stuff that I don't know what I'm doing, but if it's outside, I will do it. I'll do it all day long, every day. And that's really important to me. And, and this topic has arisen over the last, I don't know how long it's been to be completely honest, maybe like five years, like inclusivity in the outdoors and Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. I feel this tension in the outdoors community that I don't necessarily fully understand. I have a 
my background is I have a degree in anthropology. So I'm always trying to like understand why from like cultural perspective, human perspective, like, and it's not easy for me being a guy from rural Ohio to understand this topic. The neighbors I have that come over or or like the friends I have, we don't talk about inclusivity. We talk about drinking beer and shooting gun. Like that's, it's Ohio, man. Like, what do you want from me? So like, I see it continuously on mostly on Instagram. Uh, and I just don't have a good grasp of like how it's affecting the outdoors community in a broader scale. So I'm trying to like, just get people's opinions on it. Like I don't really know. I don't want to sound like an idiot. Like I don't know what, what to, how to take it in because there's so many sides. There's so many, there's like the redneck side of things and like, everybody's just bitching and crying. And then there's the other side of thing where they're like, Hey, we actually like go outside and people make us feel like shit. So it's like, I'm in the middle. I don't know. I don't have this perspective. So like you talk about it in your book a little bit, a tiny bit. So I want to under, and your podcast is about that mostly. So I want to get your perspective on this for my understanding, if not okay. anything, like I'm just yeah, yeah. clueless Ohio guy. <laughs> I love how you, I love how you asked that question. First of all, I love how you asked it because I'm in the same mindset as you believe it or not. So there's a lot to cover there. And hopefully I'll remember as you were talking, I was like, I want to hit that point. I want to hit that point. I want to hit well, that it's a point. loaded, it's a loaded <laughs> word. It's a very it's, deep word and it's a very mm-hmm. like loaded mm-hmm. from many perspectives. So not mm-hmm. to kill your train of thought, but that's how I see it is it's very mm-hmm. deep. And I don't know. I barely scratched the surface on this mm-hmm. myself. Mm-hmm. And I think uh, first I want to, I appreciate how you asked that question and always ask it that way i think the because you're so open to it and but still confused and you want to figure it out now i threw hike 10 years ago i walked into into the woods not knowing that there wasn't a lot of people of color doing what i do or what i was attempting to do um and it never crossed my mind until hikers were coming up to me and saying, Hey, we're so glad you're out here. Thank you for being out here. And I was like, well, I'm glad you're out here. Thank you for being out here. I said it just like that too. Thank you for being (laughs) That's how you have to say it. That's how white people talk, man. (laughs) Um, uh, And, uh, but they were like, no, we're really glad you're out here. And it's it's so nutty because the things that they were, they were approaching me with isn't something I would probably hear in New York City. I'm from New York City, melting pot of the world. And mm-hmm. for me, it's like, yo, I got I got friends from all over the place, you know. Yeah. Um my my ex-girlfriend is like from Alabama, you know, you can't get any whiter <laughs> than Alabama. <laughs> you, know? you, you really can't. <laughs> <laughs> so um when 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 I found out that was a thing, I couldn't believe it. A part of me was pretty sad about it because I said, that can't be right. That can't be right. So then they made that, you know how they say ignorance is bliss. I I felt like you're up to that point. I was just like, whatever, man. But I'm glad it was pointed out. um, Not necessarily because I'm like, okay, I want, I want, I want to see more people of color out, out there. You know, it wasn't the case. At first I wanted to find out if it was true. So I became a little more aware. So then I would see, I think I saw maybe two day hikers at different, different days. And it was one of the uh, black day hikers and it was their first time in the woods. You know, it's like, Mm -hmm. how's that thing? It's like, and then people just saying, Hey, I remember I was in a South South and I swear I, there was a group and I thought they've never seen a black person their entire life. (laughs) Another guy was, I have dreadlocks. Another guy was like, you're a Rastafarian, right? And I'm like, "Uh, well, I mean, I don't, it's not my religion or anything. He was like, all right. And he took a selfie and he was with me. And he was like, I can't wait to tell my wife I met a Rastafarian. I'm like, what are you talking about? So it's really, <laughs> it's really people. And, and, and mind you, all this was not done in a malicious way. People just really wanted, they wanted more uh, people of color out there. And I get that. Um, it's not something you can force. Um, but even in my book, I'm, I don't go into it like, here, I'm a black person. 
uh, a black Latino on the trail. I'm a unicorn. Look at me. No, I, I shared my story and it was different. Yeah. You know, it was a, it was a different story. And I knew the story itself would lead into those questions. But for 10 years, I mean, I know, and I don't, even with my podcast, I don't walk into, and I'm going to jump all over the place and you can, you, we can go back to it, but I feel like I want to touch on a lot of points here. When I fast forward to my podcast that came out last year, the idea was that I'm a big believer that the outdoors, the outdoor community is made up of a bunch of different communities. It's not just 100%. one one brand of people. Agree, one hundred percent. Yes. Yeah. So what I was starting to see was all these different organizations, all these different Instagram accounts, and they were just of a certain people like i'm not gonna mention there were you had black you had asian you had latino you had all these different groups but that was their group that was their knit that was what they were mm-hmm. doing you know and with the podcast long story short and i'm not going to go into names or whatever but i had a different person that was going to be my co-host and i'm telling you stuff that I haven't told anyone so you're getting like exclusive up in uh and that person wanted to direct wanted the the podcast to be directed to just people of color. It was going to be a BIPOC um, podcast. Mm -hmm. I said no, because at that point, and this is last year, my success came from the people that have been following me from the jump. And the people that have been following me are majority white people that do the outdoors, that want to do the outdoors. And I wasn't going to turn my back away from that that audience. I understand there's different groups and all that, but my audience in my head for years have been all different colors, all different colors. I'm not sticking with just one. I will do BIPOC events. And, and if you want to talk to me about diversifying the trail, I will. But when people hear the word, when they hear, you know, their first fight of trail, it, you know, that's a, like you said, it's loaded. Yeah. And even in the podcast, I talk about, it's more about unity. It's about, I wanted the podcast to be a comfortable place for everyone. So I have a person, you know, I, I, I spoke to someone that was the black first black person, to summit Mount Everest. And then I spoke to someone that was, you know, that's a a, a drag queen, (laughs) you know, that Mm -hmm. shares the outdoors. And then Jennifer Farr Davis, who is a white woman who was the fastest woman to hike the Appalachian Trail. You know, I'm a con- and I'm going to, for the second season, I'm going to continue doing that. It's going to be all different types of people that I'm going to talk to because it, the podcast is called Unlikely Stories Podcast. And I don't say unlikely because they're unlikely to do it, which they were, but it's unlikely that you've heard their story. Either it's yeah. black, white, Asian, whatever, Latino, whatever. Um, so I wanted to keep it where everyone felt comfortable listening to it. I didn't want to alienate because if you start in, this is my argument with these organizations and not that I argue with them because they love what I'm doing. I love what they're doing. Mm-hmm. But my point that I, I like to state, and I'm starting to see the change now because I, I was at this panel a few months ago and they were talking about it, how they were saying they can't do it alone and it, it can't be just about you know, let's just say, you know, BIPOC, because what you're doing then is what you were fighting against is that white people just do the outdoors and they just want it for themselves. You know, you're doing what you, what the reason why you started this group was for a reason not to do that. And now you're starting to do that, but they're starting, I'm starting to see change where they're like, no, yeah, I understand Let's push the whole, you know, let's get more people of color, Latino, Asians, all them out. Do- and I get that. Yeah. Um, but I, I'm starting to see that it's more about unity now instead of just one group. So as far as diversifying a trail or, you know, when did it happen? I know 10 years ago when I was doing my talks, that was one of the first things that people would ask me. Because I was one of the first doing these talks 10 years ago. We had few groups, um, but not as many as we have now. But I was talking, not just, I was talking about my story. And people were like, one of the first questions, like, how do we get more people of color out on a trail? Like, I have the answer. Like, I'm the spokesman (laughs) for the black community. 
Like, yeah, I know. I know. I know exactly. Let me what call up every person I know. We'll get them out here. <laughs> what do you no, want me to do? And, and my answer would be I would share why um, I didn't learn about the outdoors until I was an adult. And I give three reasons why. Um, and I, like I said, I can't speak for all black people or Latinos or Asian or because, you know, I can't. I yeah, can't. Absolutely. Uh, but I give my reason and the reasons the points that I give and I can share them with you, it, it is become something where people can relate. Like I know I've had a lot of people say, yeah, that's the reason why I was in the outdoors, you know? So, and I, let me, I'm just going to straight up tell you, share with you the three points and the three reasons why I think, or I know why I wasn't out there. My, the people around me, my family, my friends, um, one is <clears throat> knowledge. Like we didn't, I didn't know anything about the AT. <laughs> I found out about the AT when I read A Walk in the Woods. And if yeah. I didn't read that, I wouldn't have known anything about the AT, you know? I wouldn't, look, I wouldn't known anything about hiking, the outdoors, or anything, any of that stuff. I would have never found out that there's a, the Appalachian Trail is not far from the AT, I mean, from New York City, and that yeah. I can hike from New York City to the Appalachian Trail, which I, I did with my brother at one point. Um, so it was like 50 miles from New York City to, to the AT. But That's awesome. Uh, I, what was my point? I had a, I had a point. I had a point really two. strong point. <laughs> I had a really strong point. Oh, I'm I, sorry. I lost my oh. I'm good. I'm good at really distracting people and screwing up their train of thoughts. Ask anyone that's ever met me. Oh, no. Life. Okay. <laughs> no, no. It's, it's, it's the beard, man. That beard is just throwing yeah, me off. Sorry. I felt like, I felt like it, cause it's so long. I felt like I saw it reach out and grab that cup and you, you drank like your beard just grabbed it and you're drinking. Like, I was like, what is that? That's how it <laughs> works. In case people didn't so, know. Yeah. So the, the three points, the one point was obviously, like I said, um, not knowing about it. And it's one of the reasons why I wrote the you Unlikely know, Through Hiker, because on the cover, it's me, glasses and dreadlocks. And I'm like, if I was it's a kid, a I saw cover. that. Yeah, I, I, I can't take that. credit for it. Um, but we can talk about that in, in a bit. There's a story yeah. behind it. But, um, <clears throat> you know, that's, it, there was nothing like that that I could read or learn from. They were They weren't teaching me that in school so that and also um dollars man like i didn't have the money like families a lot of times you said you grew up doing this so you probably had like gear whatever that was handed down from your parents or family members or something like that no man we we didn't have that we broke you know (laughs) we trying to live like so you know if we did have like a tent we selling it for food (laughs) you know so it wasn't something that hey we're gonna go like, like we would go to the beach or, you know, Central Park or to a baseball or something like baseball game or some Coney Island. That's how that was our outdoor thing. Not going into the woods. Mm-hmm. And the third point is uh, lore, man. Like we learned that in the woods, bad things happen in the woods to, to, to black people, you know, yeah. from the, the, the Underground Railroad to you know like watching movies like friday the 13th you know where you go in the woods there's something in there or chainsaw and machete's gonna be chopping your head off <laughs> you know, so it's it's a scary thing for us you, i'm from new york city you know like brooklyn you know i lived in in pennsylvania and philly for a while and these are all like you know, these are city places and it's it's wild in itself mm-hmm. and I say this all the time, there's more danger in Brooklyn than there is in, you know, in, in the woods and the Appalachian, on the Appalachian Trail. Um, but yeah, I think educating in what I do with my podcast, my talks and everything else, I always say the three points that I always want to do that I want people to get at least one out of it is I want to either, and I never thought I would be saying this, because I never thought I would be a person to inspire anyone, but to inspire, to to educate, and to entertain. Those are the three things I want to do. Those are the three things that yeah. I want to do when I'm sharing this with people. And if you get one or two or all three, it's I'm grand. I'm like I'm I'm happy about it. Um, and I think if we get more people um, doing that, then it, there would be like a little Derek that would go, "Hey, you know what? Let's go." Look at look at this. Like I'm currently writing a children's book. Uh, oh, um, nice. It's not a, ver- a children's book version of the Unlikely Through Hiker, but that ca- the character in there does go through what Mister Fabulous goes through in the book. So 
all the scares and all the new mm-hmm. stuff and all that. But um, because I want to continue sharing about the outdoors and I want more people to do it, not just Latinos or blacks, but I want everyone to be out there. We belong out there. It's it's out there, you know? Well, that's <laughs> that's such a good point because I, I think it was – uh, you did the podcast, your podcast with Earl Jones, I think is his name from Black Folks Earl, Camp Earl, Two. Yeah, yeah, Earl B. Earl. Hunter Jr. Yeah, B. Earl Hunter Jr. Sorry. Uh, yeah, he he made so many good points in his podcast and in in that podcast, and that guy has such good energy, and that's kind of where I'm at too. It's like I want everyone to go outside. I don't give a shit who it is. Like it can be anybody. Like. The, the outdoors is for everyone. We all pay for the outdoors. It, it, public <laughs> land is coming out of our tax money. Like, yep. I wish every single person would flood the parks to the point where they had to, like, redo all their infrastructure. And everyone that listens to this that will be so pissed at me for saying that. But, like, that's <laughs> what it's going to that's what it's going to take to, like, make conservation a, a topic on people's mind and, like, worry about, like – this wouldn't be a conversation if if they sold all of our land off to oil or big business or whatever or timber or whatever. Mm-hmm. Like we wouldn't be having this conversation right now. We would be like in court trying to fight these people for what we love so much. And that's that's really to me the main point of everything is like everyone get outside. Love the outdoors. It's it's like our heritage as human beings, man. Like that's and, I, that's what I love. And the beautiful thing is that you're not going to overcrowd the, the outdoors. There's a lot of outdoors and there's no way you're going to, it's going to get too crowded. You know, I've yeah. been, again, I'm from New York city in the subway, a subway train that's crowded. That's yeah. you're, you're in there, that's crowded, but you in yeah. the outdoors, uh-uh, it's not going to happen. You're fine. Let's go, all go out there at the same time. And I bet you there's still a lot more room for, for everyone else. Yeah, and it's you know there's a there's a balance between conservation and overcrowding and all these these topics. I've read so many. I'm I'm reading this book right now. It's called Wilderness Ethics. If you ever want something that's like really not storytelling and very like, but like it talks about how people that work in the outdoors think about the outdoors mm-hmm. and these topics are really which that book you know whatever it is what it is. I just like reading about the outdoors, but like. The thing is, is like, I think it's such a precious resource that not many people are taking advantage of. Uh, The Uh outdoors community is big, but it's not Uh that big. Like, there's Uh not that many of us out there trying to convince people to get outdoors because there's a huge population of outdoorsmen and women who are want to keep it to themselves. Uh And they want to keep these secret places that they love so much, which can you blame them sometimes? There's so much beauty out there in the world that you can't get to unless you climb a 3000 foot peak. You know what I'm saying? Like there's it's so like, much. Yeah. Go ahead. It's like finding, it's like finding like treasure yes. and you want to keep it all to yourself. Yeah. You're like, I want to be, I don't want everyone else to be like, take this. Cause I won't be as rich. You yeah. know, it's like finding like a, 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 like a big bag of treasure. And you're like, I'm not sharing this with anyone. That's kind of it. Like you just, if, if you do the outdoors, you just discovered riches and healing. You know, and a lot of times, you know, people are just like, well, you know, this is my trail. And I want, you know, I love that it's just, no, oh, no, 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 no. If, if, if it heals you, don't you think it could heal your neighbor? Mm-hmm. Don't you, wouldn't you like, wouldn't you like a neighbor that was the most loveliest neighbor? And it's because they're, they do the outdoors. Don't you want to share that? Don't you want to go to the grocery store? And, 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 and the person that's like, bringing your groceries they don't have an attitude because they love the outdoors i'm not (laughs) saying that's how it works but i'm saying that and i'm being you know i'm being extreme here but my point is is that it will make people better it is it's it's very healing i say this all the time i remember i went a stretch without hiking for i think it was like a month or so and when i went out there and i was like it's like working you ever like work out and get to the point where you feel really good and you're like oh this is how it feels to be healthy yes. and, and in good shape that's yes. that's how it is when you go in the outdoors you know and, and every and, and, time and, yes every single time dude yeah that's 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 it you just summed up my entire thought process on everything like this is what matters to like me obviously you and i i the whole point with inclusivity that i wanted to bring up i think is Mm -hmm. is 
to me, it's never been an issue in the sense of I've never wanted to keep the outdoors to myself. I guarantee you there are people out there that do. And mm-hmm. so, like, that's why it's so confusing to me because I was like, I don't care if you're green. Get out here. Like, go outside. It's awesome. And, and like, my... But they're, 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 they're not to cut you off, but that yeah. I've seen this on social media where there was an article written about uh, hi, uh, black people of the outdoors. And I was, I was, you know, I was mentioned in it. Mm-hmm. And then they got heat from that article because because they were like well we're not stopping black people from or BIPOC or Latin we're not stopping them from going out in the outdoors they're stopping themselves that's like you know that's the point that they give and 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 that's the argument I hear all the time conversely to what you're saying that's why I'm so I'm trying to find answers that are right but the, the and I don't have the answer to that. That no, no, no. Yeah, the, the way they respond. But my point is, is that it's not. And I go to the three points about you know not being educated, not having the resources and the lore. Like, yeah, no, no, no one's stopping us. But the point is, is that no one was really sharing it with us. No one was telling us about it. No one was saying, "Hey, this is out there." No, one, that's the point. It's not the point that, you know, someone's stopping us from going out there. No one's stopping us from going out there. But no one's educating us. No one's telling us, hey, this is how you do it. This is how you... you know, it took me a while to, like, when I hit a trail, like, where's the trailhead? You know, like, I don't know what mm-hmm. a trailhead is. It's like, they said yeah. the trail's here, but I can't find a trailhead. And, you know, if you're not used to being in the outdoors, you might be uncomfortable about that. You might be like, mm-hmm. you know, I'm a person of color by the woods, and what am I, who am I going to ask? Like, where's, you know what I mean? So it's it's not about you know, like you're stopping us is that we want to know more about it. You know, like give us all the, we want it. We want the options is, is, is the options to say, yes, we want to go out there or no. And we never had the option. Not, and I'm not again, speaking for the entire black community, but my point is, is that it, I feel like you, when you grow up in that, that's fine. And there's white, black, all types that grow up in that. And you know, you grow up in, Hey, that's how, you know, that's how I live. But when you come from a place like New York city, you got to understand that it's going to be alien. It's going to be something where it's a different world to you. It's an, for me, it was a discovery country almost. It's like, what in the world did I step into? Where's Bigfoot? (laughs) You know, was that (laughs) nailed? You know? So it's, it, go ahead. No, that no, those are super so, important points. Yeah. Yeah. So it's where you're from. It's it's how you grew up. You know, it's not just that people are stopping us. It's like, yeah, man, we just we're just saying that it it wasn't something that was part of our lives and now we want it to be. Yeah. Um and there's a, and I understand both sides and I, I can understand, you know, there should never be frustration and on either side. First of all, I hate when there is a frustration or dislike when there's a frustration because there shouldn't be. You know, when you're discussing about some discussing about the outdoors, you should not be angry about it. <laughs> you know, um, you should understand. You should stop and listen. Yeah. <laughs> stop and listen to what the other group is saying. Like, I have my point and I want to hear why you think this way. Like, I always say this. Um, a couple of years ago when, you know, we went through the election and all that. And I have friends that are, you know, from both sides. Mm-hmm. And um, I would listen to both. Even if I had one side or I thought one thing, I'm like, okay, let me hear your point. I wouldn't go, well, no, 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 this is the way it should go. No, listen, find out. Because they're not bad people. Just because you think one way or the other, you're not a bad, we're all, we're good people. I mean, for the most part, humans are good and i learned this on the trail yeah, actually same you know humanity is kind yes we have our you know our our moments some are darker than others but for the most part people want to be understood you know people don't want to be judged um and i felt like when i was on the appalachian trail when i threw high thing you probably felt this as well that's why you love it and you share and you have this podcast um is that i didn't feel like i was judged on a trail and i could have been because yeah. i had zero experience i was never judged 
And um, you may have thought like, hey, this guy's not going to finish the trail or what's he doing out here? But it was never, no, no one out there, I can't, I don't have one moment where I felt like I didn't belong or it, people were being malicious to me, so. And that's that's a, a very, very good point that not a lot of people will ever experience because not a lot of people are going to through like any trail. We're mm-hmm. a vast minority of people that have done something like this and we can tout the benefits of through hiking all day, but even just getting outside in general is going to do a lot for you. If you can overcome the, I guess the entry fee, which is kind of like getting over the fear of being dirty, getting over the fear of bugs and this and that, because like my, my experience with people of color in the outdoors is one of my, my, one of my good friend, Will, and my brother-in-law, Tony, who's one of my best friends, my like my brother in law Tony, we go we have a you know, he has a place up on a lake here in Michigan. That's where I go ice fishing, and he has no desire to go outside ever. And I'm like, like we have a podcast together, man. We work together. We we I see him three four days a week. His his children are my nieces and nephews. They love fishing. They love the outdoors. Yeah. And but like my brother in law, he's like, no, nah, I want to play video games and watch TV. I was like, yeah, but let's go. I, he's like, he likes to run. He likes to. I was like, let's go run at the park. He's like, no, there's bugs, and I'm not doing it. Um, and it's just okay. like it's like a, uh, uh, and that's not because he's black. Some people just do not like the outdoors. <laughs> like yeah. that is. Yeah. I was just gonna say it's just he does yeah. it. Doesn't want to do it. And I, it's I not it. for everyone, and it's just right. like how much of it is not cultural in the sense of uh, black, Mexican, Latino, white, whatever. How much is it cultural is America? Like the mm-hmm. majority of Americans do not go outdoors. Well, I have, I have, I have a question for you. Yeah. Uh, your brother-in-law, has he gone out there? Like, is he I, just saying bugs out there or has he gone out there and experienced bugs? Cause if he hasn't, then you need to take him out there. I'm working on it. We ran at the park one time, which he was fine. Okay. He liked it. I took him out ice fishing and he was totally underdressed, but he said it was fun. But that was probably just because we're drinking beer. I'm trying to get him on an overnight, like Manistee National Forest, something. Guarantee yeah. you he'll love it. Guarantee you. Yeah. You can't say, and that's that's another thing. And, and this is just anyone. But when people are like, yeah, you know what? I ain't going to do it because, you know, it's it it smells out there. You know, like, you don't know that. It smells good. What are you talking about? It actually smells good. What's wrong with you? <laughs> um, yeah. So yeah, if if he, I, I was gonna say like if he was out there already several times, he just didn't like it. Then all right, it's it's fine, you know. But if he hasn't, get his get his ass out there. <laughs> I'm gonna make him listen to this and try and yeah, get him out man. there because I want everyone to get out there. But you know, I don't I don't want to keep you forever. I could talk forever. We both have mm-hmm. podcasts, so we probably both could talk forever. But. This, <laughs> This this quote that you said really struck a chord with me so much because that's kind of where I'm at now at like six, seven years out of through hiking. And I do this podcast. I talk about the outdoors a lot. I still do a lot of outdoors activities, but obviously it's not on the scale of 15, 10, 20 miles a day anymore. And you're probably right there with me. So um, we get caught up in the doldrum stuff of, of day-to-day life. So you said, do I get a prize for doing such a challenge? No. Do I care? No. <laughs> I love that so <laughs> freaking much, dude, because I feel the same way about building. Like people are always like, I'm building my social media. I'm building my YouTube. And I was like, I would love to have people hear this message of like, just go outside and learn about the outdoors. But like, do yeah. I give a shit if nobody's listening or nobody's subscribing? Like, of course not, because this is what I care about. I love the outdoors and I love talking to people about the outdoors. So that message like kicked me right in the teeth, man. So how did you come yeah. to that conclusion? Because it, it wasn't about anyone else. It was about I did it for myself. I did yes. it for and it wasn't just like, you know, it was just like, in, in fact, if, you know, the rest of that story is that. So the story is that I did the quad state challenge, which is, or attempted to do it. I did. It's I didn't four even states. Try that. Yeah. It's four states. I know it was nutty, but here's the thing. I, when I was on the Appalachian trail, when you're hiking every day, I wanted to change it up. You're mm-hmm. hiking every day. As soon as you get up, 
and then you know, before you get started or whatever, and then you're doing it every day for six months. And I wanted to change it up. That's just, I wanted to do that because I knew that was part of me. That was how I was going to continue if I changed it up, keeping it positive and trying to figure out ways where, uh, and it always changed because you move on and the terrain changes, places, all that. But I wanted to add that little extra. So the Quad State Challenge is four states, uh, and you hike it within 24 hours. And it's uh, Virginia, West Virginia, Maryland, and Pennsylvania. Mm-hmm. And I, I started doing it. And ha- I would say halfway through it, I knew I made a mistake. I was like, this is just not a good thing, but I'm going to do it. Because I wanted that challenge. And then I, I think... I know was when I ran into that guy with yep. his kids and he, and I was, I was excited that I was doing it. And although I was tired, I was excited. And he said, why would you want to do this? Like, do you get, do you get a, what was it? A prize? Well, how did I word it in the book? Did you get a reward or something? And, and at yeah, the end, you get a prize, and yeah. I said, I said, no, I, I don't. And then he kind of deflated like my excitement. And I was like, he's right. Why am I? And I was like, but you know what? I'm not doing it for anyone else. I'm doing it for, because I ended up not, I missed it by like an hour or something. So I did it in like 25 hours or something like that. Uh, For many reasons, because you have to read the book because my pack was heavy. I had five books and a bunch of, a combination of things uh, that I wish I I could have done differently. But the, the point of that moment was that it didn't matter what people thought and, you know, why I was doing it. It wasn't for them. It was for me, whether I finished it or not. The the idea was that I was going to do something different and I was going to attempt it. And if I did it, great. And I did do it. I did the entire thing. And I just did do it under 24 hours. Didn't hit the arbitrary time. Yeah, right. That that was the (laughs) goal of it. But I, I was, although I was exhausted, I pitched my tent. I went to sleep, woke up the next day and I was like, I'm never going to do that again but (laughs) i was glad i did it for many reasons there was there was lessons that i got out of it so why did i do it i can give you a bunch of reasons why i did it but do i do i necessarily need to share that with you with that attitude no i ain't telling you (laughs) you know like but i felt like the guy just he was so confused why i was doing such a thing and i was like you know what it's, I, you know, I, I did it cause I could do it. You that's, know, um, that's I, the entire I, I, Appalachian trail in a nutshell. Yeah. People are confused why you're doing it and you just do it anyways. And that's a good thing to live by, man. Like don't do things for other people. Like that's mm-hmm. such a dumb thing to worry about right. because who cares? They don't live your life. They don't live your day in day out. Like do what you want to do for you. And if people yep. like it, great. That, yeah. That's, um, and so before we wrap up here, uh, I, Great conversation. One of the, one of the <laughs> better conversations I've had in a long time. So I appreciate that very much. And uh, I like to ask before I wrap up my podcast, if there's anything not outdoors, doesn't have to be outdoors, can be sentiments, uh, ideologies you share or whatever that you would like people to know, because I think that's really important. Like I, I find it interesting how people – their minds work and how they live their lives because it's it's like if you could say something to everyone like as a closing statement on your life what would that be mm, that's that's deep that's a man. deep question yeah no, it's so, so every ev- everything that i do now wraps around the outdoors for the most part which is nutty for me to to awesome. even say i'm um, hyped for it <laughs> yeah and i'm and i and i approach it with like, like I said before, I'm a storyteller. So I approach it, whether it's writing, doing a podcast, having a conversation, um, uh, or just any way I can, I can figure out how to share the outdoors. Cause I feel like at this point in my life, it's not about me anymore. It's, um, I want to live for others. I've lived my entire life. I, I lived a New York life. I've had the best in my twenties. I've had the best twenties you can, you can have, you know, I did all the things, but it was really for me. Mm-hmm. And now I want to do, and now that I do have the platform and I have an audience and 
it's expected from me, but I don't necessarily have to just step up and do the things. But I feel like I want to I want to do more for others. And I because I, I know as much as I want to live forever, I know I'm not. And I want the second half of my life to be or the, you know, what, how much time I have uh, to be about others. And I wish growing up, I would, I encountered people that were like that. I grew up in, you know, and I don't, I'm not, that's, this is another, that's another hour of talking, but I grew up in an environment where the word love was not tossed around easily. I didn't hear, you know, my parents saying that to me when I was younger. Um, And I don't want anyone to feel sorry for me, but I grew up in, in a tough, really, and everyone has grown up and, you know, had child different childhoods i'm not saying i'm different Mm -hmm. but my point is is that um it was really all about me when i was younger because i was trying to get out of that rut and try to discover myself and as i discovered myself i realized that and the at did help with that but going into it there was changes happening with me and i realized that we're on this planet not alone we're with others and we can't do this alone Mm-hmm. And there's a quote, and I wish I had it in front of me, and I wish you would have pointed that quote out in the book, <laughs> where someone comes up to me and he says, this is the last time I see you. Uh, this may be the last time I see you, but remember these words. And I think he mentions, wait a minute, wait a minute. I think I may have marked it in my book. So I don't want this. You to wrote marked. it. Come on. <laughs> I did write it. But you know what? I, you know what? I, I, I've written so much after this. Like, I, I know. Memorize everything I okay. Okay. Here you go. I got it. I got it marked. Okay. He goes, Perfect. he looks me straight in the eyes. This will be the last time I see you. He says, so I'll leave you with these words. Be kind to all. Don't take your friends for granted and be memorable. I got the chills just that's where it's at man and I said you know what and that's how I live my life now I and I don't take people for granted and um just just surround yourself with people good people um align yourself with people that believe in what you're you're doing um or maybe straighten you out like (laughs) you know like you know so um but one of the biggest lessons I got on the trail was that I, le- I realized, and there's a chapter in the book called um, a, a Suspicious Mind, where I talk about, you know, New York and how growing up and, and this and that. And the, all the affection I got on the AT, I was like, what's going on here? And it took me a while to get used to that. Um, and I came out of that realizing that humanity is so much, so much better than I thought it was. So, or it is. Um, so just keep that in mind. People are good. Um, yeah. Yeah. That's dude, that, that's a great way to live. And, and it's so funny because I feel like we all reach these same conclusions, at, not even through hiking the AT, just like uh, by understanding what's important to you and who is good to be around. Like, like you mm-hmm. said, you surround yourself with people who help you they don't have to mm-hmm. agree with you they don't have mm-hmm. to be you need friends that talk shit to you and tell you you suck sometimes yeah. because yeah, we man. do we we get caught up in our own bullshit and we just like we need people to be like hey you're being an asshole dude then like we all need i need that continuously yep. every day of my yep. life i need that but um i great life advice uh before we finalize here where is i like to say this to authors where is the most beneficial place for people to get your book um, you can get it anywhere, but I have it on my website. You can get a signed copy at DerekLugo.com. Um, and also to follow my next adventures, my writing projects and what I'm up to, uh, on Instagram at Derek Lugo. Um, I have obviously Facebook at Derek Lugo as well, mm-hmm. uh, personal and an unlikely through hiker one, but, um, most of my posts and everything I do is on Instagram. So at Derek Lugo. And I will link all that down in the show notes and YouTube notes and whatever they're called. I can't keep up anymore. Everything's (laughs) got different annotations and stuff. So, Derek, 
Mr. Fabulous, I appreciate uh, one through hiker to another. I appreciate what you're doing for the outdoors world. And, you know, I just enjoy talking. Thanks, man. This was dynamite.